Thank you for attending, and we are coming here for the work session, so we'll call the order and it's five one. In the Crater School District, provide excellence for every student that each will reach their greatest potential. Thank you to the members of the public who joined us as a reminder school board meetings and work sessions are meetings of the board held in public, providing an opportunity to observe the board's discussion and actions. In an effort to conduct official board business and ask that all things be respectful and refrain from questions, comments, and unnecessary warnings while the board conducts the meeting. They're created this and hosted that part. Um, also, please note that all board meetings are live streamed and posted on the school board area of the website. Um, and today we're going to do a in order, what's checking? What's checking for the superintendent evaluation process should look like? Um, we look at communication styles, we look at the exercise, introduction to critical conversations, and how this translates to board work. So I think we turn it over to you. Yeah. Thank you. I know I've only got an hour of your time, so we'll move on it quickly. Um, thank you for having me for coming early to your board meeting. We've got a couple of things to accomplish. We're going to talk about, um, now that you've got your superintendent evaluation process decided on, we're going to talk a little bit about what those um, what those check-ins should look like as you go about doing those, those quarter check-ins. And then we'll move into the book that you are reading and talk about um, crucial conversations and how you might start using this in uh, in the boardroom and how far you got in the book and um, and um, some work going forward because I'll have some homework for you. Um, so we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, well, I just did that. I just did the agenda. Sorry. <laughs> keep moving. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So first we'll go over the superintendent evaluation check-in. So how often do you want to do these? Um, this is up to you. We recommend them quarterly. Some boards do them just twice, just once in the middle, um, and uh, just a mid-year check-in. So I think that it's important just to decide, you know, how often you want to do these between now and when you do your your superintendent evaluation. Um, I think we we talked about this, but that check-in should be aligned to the standards and include progress on goals, right? So you. You adopted some goals, you've adopted that tool, you're aligning the evaluation to standards. And so you want to make sure that you are um, looking at the same things that you'll look at at the end of the year. So whatever you're evaluating on, you want to talk about that because that keeps that message consistent. Um, what we recommend um, is that you kind of do this in the same way that you would do the the evaluation at the end of the year you want to give gary a one voice evaluation because the board is that that one voice and you don't want you know everybody to start sort of weighing in differently so what we recommend is that the board meets first go over what you want to say and and have that one voice message it's usually it doesn't have to be it's usually the chair that gives that one voice message you know here's what we're thinking about standards so far here's what we're thinking about goals if, um, if prior to that meeting, um, your superintendent wants to give you some like, you know, here's where I've gotten on goals, here's where I think I'm performing, you can consider those things in advance. You may already have a lot of that information based on board meetings and superintendent reports and the kinds of information you already get, but you may want some of that in advance. But having that one voice message during that check-in is really important. But then there's the opportunity to have that conversation for, you know, there to be, you know, for Gary to be able to ask questions and provide some um, or ask for clarification to provide some feedback to you, to you, for you to provide some feedback to him. And that check in, the, the real purpose of that is to really just create these, um, you know, we don't want to get to the end of the year and have anything be a surprise. So it is for both accountability and support. 
if um, if changes need to be made to goals or something because something isn't necessarily maybe uh, attainable, you know, that can be made at that time, um, not during that meeting, which I'll tell, tell you, but not during the um, executive session, which we'll talk about in a second, but, or if greater resources are needed to meet a goal, where it's attainable, but we're looking at maybe a shift in, in allocation of resources, that can be discussed at that time. Um, if there's something on the standards that the board wants to talk about, that can be discussed at that time. But the point is to just give feedback along the way and for your superintendent to also be able to self-reflect along the way. Um, you do want to document the conversation as you would anything else. Of course, there would be minutes for an, an executive session anyway, but everybody wants to be able to remember the conversation that you have. So like, you know, in a personnel file, there would be a documentation of the conversation. And you can also um, look at that later when you're doing the full evaluation that you, you met in executive session. This is what you talked about. One of the most important pieces is sticking to the ORS, is sticking to the reason that you went into executive session. So you want to make sure that you are having an evaluative conversation. This is not about district goals. It's not about the mission vision. It's not about overarching anything. This is an evaluative conversation. And as long as you're doing that, you can be um, in executive session. If there needs to be modifications to goals or changes in allocation of resources or anything like that, you would need to do those things in public session. So you, any decisions that you would make as a result of that executive session, you'd have to come out and make action items later. Um, probably put those on a future agenda because you wouldn't want to just like surprise the public with additional agenda items at your next meet or at that next meeting. So that's how those should go. And you know, one of the things that we have heard from boards and from superintendents is that these conversations are really valuable because they do give both the board and the superintendent an opportunity to connect and reflect and, um, and just have those checkpoints along the way. And that that leads to an easier process at the end of the year because there have been those sort of semi-formal um, checkpoints throughout the year. Thoughts on that? Questions on that? We had generally one on our calendars to do this next month. Yeah. In order, um, in February. Mm -hmm. And then have the actual one okay. in April, mm -hmm. um, for this year. And I had planned on maybe a week or two, at least two weeks, maybe three at the next board meeting. I'll try to send the board um, a document that outlines, um, remember at the beginning of the year, we created this document that had two goals and then a bunch of tasks. So I'll kind of highlight, oh, I've completed this task. This one is in progress. This one hasn't even started yet kind of thing to give you some data on those two goals. But after you get that, if there's anything else that you want, let me know. That'll be the only thing that I provided to you. Um, I wanted to mention, because you talked about it on that executive session, I kind of get on an executive session. Mm -hmm. It's an agenda item in the regular meeting. Mm -hmm. So in that, we will come out and you make some decisions back in the regular meeting. But when we post these meetings, um, well, I guess, no, because it'll still be an executive session item at the regular meeting. So I suppose they could come out and make some determination. They could. They could change the agenda of the regular meeting and add some decision that needed to be made. You don't want to get in the habit of doing that because it wasn't. It's not really need that those. Not really. Because it would, probably would be an emergency that you would right. need to change okay. that. Yeah. I just want to make sure everybody yeah. was on the same page there. So yeah, November we'll have our first check-in. Last item on the agenda will be an executive session. Three um, will stay and take minutes. I'll just leave. You guys have your discussion. Whenever you're ready, I'll come back in. I'll get you that document at least two weeks ahead of that board meeting. If you want anything else, let me know. Okay. Any questions or thoughts about that? Okay. I think you'll find that's a good process. All right. We can move on. Oh. Okay, crucial conversations. We started reading this book, and I'll have a few. 
scrolling. Sorry about that. No, it's just weird the title slide. <laughs> okay, before we get into, before I start going into something, I would love just to have your reflections on what you've read so far. <clears throat> what are you, what's your think about the, about the book in general? <laughs> yes, Lisa. I absolutely love it. Yeah, what do you love about it? Um, the tone, mm -hmm. the wording, mm -hmm. how it's written. I mean, just, I just, I just loved it. Mm -hmm. I, I read the first two chapters twice, mm -hmm. and then went back and highlighted, it, mm -hmm. and then found myself in chapter five. Mm -hmm. So I was like, so "You're ahead. You're working ahead." Stop, stop. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? It, it just, and it was common sense. Mm -hmm. That's what I really liked about it. It wasn't a lot of. Um, well, maybe I could do this, or maybe I could do that. There's just so much common sense in it, and so much more real those things. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm really good. Good. I'm glad you're enjoying it. It's funny you say common sense because if it was common sense, right, you probably would like to work on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> wouldn't need it. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Good so far. Any other? Any other just general reflections so far? I um yeah, I think common sense is a good word, but it puts um it puts language to something you might have already known. Mm -hmm. You know, like two things I highlighted a lot of stuff. I've only read two chapters, although I did. I think I have read this book a while ago. Um, I like the one, the first one that I really highlighted was. It ends the thought of, as a result, you end up facing challenges, conversations with the same equipment available to a rhesus monkey. So that was the dialogue around, you know, I'm in a high, I'm in an intense conversation, opinions are needed. What happens internally to your body is, you know, hormones are released, blood gets going away from your brain and out to your fist. Mm -hmm. And thus, the thing you actually really need in this conversation, your brain, isn't getting what it needs. You have all these things going on inside your body to drive you away from that. Mm -hmm. and that's definitely for sure. I mean, I've mm -hmm. seen that not only others, but in myself, where, okay, you start not to think clearly or listen well, mm -hmm. you get excited. Mm -hmm. So right. just putting that language mm -hmm. on to that. And I also really like, and definitely something I buy into, I don't remember the exact wording it used, but uh, I'll hear this. Um, when the shared pool, uh, is shallow, mm -hmm. right? If Gary makes decisions with greed over lunch, we're not going to come up with as good a decision if I have every administrator, you, you know, other leaders in the district or whatever. Um, the more people you can include in a conversation, even though, let's say it's an instance where one of us or myself might have a path of an idea I want to go down, you know, I don't have all the information mm -hmm. and listening to others before you make key decisions, I think it's, it's important. Not only does it put a sense of, you know, having everyone feel valuable to the conversation, but undoubtedly, I'm often not the smartest guy in the room. And you're the other smart people. No. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought mostly in the first chapter, too, and I just, for some reason, uh, I kept thinking about perspective. I mean, it just really is. Um, you know, I can see where someone's perspective is a little bit different on whether it needs to be a crucial conversation or not, mm -hmm. depending on just your experience and uh, your background and, mm -hmm. and, you know, what is really critical and mm -hmm. or crucial and, and uh, you know, as far as, so that's what I, I use the perspective is really, mm -hmm. you know, that was, yeah. in my mind. It came to my mind is three times I listened to it on Audible, mm -hmm. the first chapter. I listened to the second chapter entirely once and then fell asleep twice listening to the second chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but I did listen to it entirely once. So. <laughs> I thought the first was more towards groups and the second was towards individuals. I thought was, they were both good, but I just I listened to them on the night that I didn't listen to <laughs> You woke up your chapter 17. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, absorbed right, both of them last night again, and it was like, uh, I woke up and I was still in chapter two, but I didn't finish part of it. Somehow absorbed it. Right now, it's really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, it's interesting, Gary, that you mentioned, you know, the end and also mark the, the perspective, um, but, you know, sort of what happens to us when we start having sort of tense conversations and, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but not too far because I'll bring us back to this particular thing, but there is, you know, a lot of research in relationship, just in relationship itself, that, you know, like when we get elevated and all of that, like sometimes we need a break from that because it takes, like, it takes 20 minutes for our nervous system to calm down, yeah. right? Like we need sometimes literally a 20 minute break for all of those, like, you know, the adrenaline and all of that to actually go away before we can engage. So there's, you know, there's part of that too. Um, but also the the piece about like, you know, having multiple perspectives in, in decision making too. I mean, and that's what, you know, I'm gonna ask you later, like how can this be applied to board work? And I think that that's, you know, alluding to one of those things is like, you know, having the, the multiple perspectives, if they're, if I haven't said it to you, I say it to every single board, if there only needed to be one perspective on a board, there only needed to be one board member, right? So, I mean, it's really important that you all are part of making decisions and as we know, on every single board, there are times where like we disagree when we're making decisions or when we're having conversations at the board table. And so this um, this book we found can really be, you know, give you a set of tools to have those conversations. So we'll dive into some specifics. That's cool. So probably saw this as part of it, right? A crucial conversation is one where there are opposing opinions, strong emotions, and then it's high stakes. Right, all of those three pieces play into what what is considered a crucial conversation. And as you know, as I read through this, as you read through this, you're probably imagining like, yep, this can happen in the boardroom, at work, and in the group life. Right, like all of those pieces, like this is everywhere. So that's um, what a crucial conversation is. And these are the these are the components right there. And I don't know that you've gotten to all of these yet, but I'm going to go through all of it. In fact, there are chapters dedicated to each of these. So I, I'm going to go over briefly all of these. Um, the first is, and I'll break them down a little bit more as we go. Start with the heart. Then there's learn to look, make it safe, master my stories, which we'll talk about. State my path. That's intention explore others paths move to action and then there's the yeah but which is you know what we all do at the end like yeah this sounds great but <laughs> right um okay I'm keep going. sorry i'm here anymore <laughs> okay so the start with the heart piece um is and and i will say like this set of questions is probably the, one of the most powerful tools, and I and I talk to a lot of boards about this because this set of questions is a really quick set of questions that we can ask ourselves, like in the middle of a conversation. You can do this in the boardroom, you can do this at home, you can do this at work. But when you're having that, like when you're engaging or starting to engage in what feels like it's going to be a tough conversation, we naturally ask ourselves, "What do I really want?" Right? I mean, that's kind of, you know, we can get into a defensive spot. What do I really want for myself? The next question is, what do I really want for that other person too? And that's sort of where we like can come out of what we want for ourselves. What do I really want for others? The next one is really important, particularly as, you know, we look toward board work or group work at all. What do I really want for the relationship? And when we think about, I mean, again, I'm going to ask you, how do we apply this? But when we think, so, I mean, let's look through that lens of board work when we think about what do I really want for the relationship here as we enter or as we start to feel like, a, you know, a, a high stakes conversation come on. And then this question is, you know, how would I behave if I really wanted these results? So if I'm looking at positives and what do I want for myself, I'm looking at the positive and what I want for someone else. If I'm looking at something positive and what I want for the relationship. How would I need to behave? How would I need to behave if I wanted those results? Which may, which can, I would say, I've used this in a conversation with my teenage daughter and that has like changed my behavior. Like, well, how would I act, right? <laughs> and then there's, you know, the fool's choice piece where we think that we're either going to get results or save the relationship, but we can't have both. And that's, that is not true. We can both get results in a relationship and save, or in a situation and still maintain the relationship. It's not an either or. 
And that's the startling question. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but. So how do we notice when we're getting into these conversations where we might need to call upon some tools? And, and a lot of us notice this, you know, when we're in person, it's much easier than when we're on the phone or when we're over text or even when we're over Zoom. You know, there are physical signals, people cross their arms, they might sit back, you know, the face changes, you know, emotional and behavioral signals, tone of voice, um, really short answers to questions, just signaling distance in a lot of ways or changing behavior. And you know, if you know somebody relatively well or you just recognize that their behavior is changing relative to what you know about them. And so those then there were those safety problems, meaning does somebody feel safe in the conversation? Again, silence, avoiding, withdrawing. Violence does not mean physical violence, but um, controlling, labeling, or verbally attacking. So trying to control a situation or control your behavior, labeling, not name calling, but pretty close. Like, you know, like you're being this, or this conversation is just this, or something where it's no longer an open conversation. It is, it is a thing that is negative at that point. Um, you haven't gotten to chapter four yet, but I will ask you to do this for next time. There is a quiz called, or a test called Style Under Stress that you can take that shows um, how, how you respond under stress. And that'll be, that'll be something I will ask you to do, which is interesting and elucidating. I took it myself, obviously, um, uh, a long time ago. But um, yeah, so that, that sort of will give you a picture of how you handle these kinds of things um, when you're approaching tough conversations. So how do you make a situation safe, particularly in the moment as you're approaching a tough conversation? We do this all the time as boards, right? We talk all the time about how, you know, in the end, we are all here to make a positive difference for students. We're all here to do that. And we all have to assume, even in our differences, that everybody is here for the same purpose, to make a positive difference for kids. We may come at it differently. We may have different ideas about it. But we're all here, and we all operate under that assumption. I think it is in, if we're going to focus specifically on our board work, it is when we get away from that belief that things start to get pretty touchy as far as our relationship as a board. But if we start with a mutual purpose, which is which can go back to those start with the heart questions, what do I want for myself? What do I want from you? What do I want for the relationship? And then how would I act if I wanted all those positive things? We can get to that mutual purpose. And if you've got more than one person in a conversation that's doing that, that's you know doing those behaviors, that's why that, Part of the reason why we use this book with boards is that then everybody's got the same background. It's it can be, you know, you can use these tools all you want, but there are some times where it's hard to start with a mutual purpose sometimes with somebody who's not in on the same plane as you. But um, moving to mutual respect and asking, will others believe that I respect them? So going back to that question of, you know, how would I act if I wanted all of those positive things that I just answered in those start with a hard question? So if I am going to say that I respect you, will you believe it? If yes, that means I'm, I should be able to answer the question that I can demonstrate that you will believe me. If I say no, what is happening? What, what can I take? What is my part in, in the fact that you won't believe that I respect you? I may not own the entire thing, but what is my part in that? And that's something to tease out. So the, the next part is part of, part of fixing misunderstanding. And I will say this, this next bullet I use this 
all the time. It's not about me, but like I will say that that this is a really, really effective tool when talking to somebody for clarification. It's really common that we clarify what we mean. We do that all the time in conversations. Here's what I mean. I, I do feel this way. Um, and uh, and this is and this is what I mean. But we don't always complete the circle and say, but here's what I'm not saying. We will often say, here's what I'm saying, here's what I'm saying, here's what I'm saying. But the end of that clarification, completing that circle is saying, but here's what I'm not saying, because I don't want you to walk away thinking this. Because in, in the absence of saying, like, I can tell you, you know, here's what I'm saying, but if I don't clarify that here's something I don't want you to believe as, as I walk away, you may make up a story in, in your head. Like, I don't want you to walk away having made up a story about something just because I didn't clarify it over here. So filling up that circle and saying, here's what I mean, but here's what I don't mean. Here's what I'm not saying. It can be, that can be a really powerful thing to, to include as part of a clarifying conversation. That in and of itself can be a really powerful tool. And that is not apologizing, but it provides context and proportion. So it doesn't always have to feel like, you know, why should I apologize when I didn't do anything wrong? You know, like I think a lot of people get into that headspace, like I'm not always going to sit and apologize. And we don't always have to sit and apologize. But then also this book will say apologize when it's perfect. Um, but but doing that, that clarity um, also makes the conversation safer. So starting with that mutual purpose, like trying to get to that mutual understanding, some sort of assumption that you're all in it for a mutual purpose, Under, asking yourself the question of, do they believe that I respect them and what's my part in that? And then clarifying what you mean and what you don't mean. Any questions on that piece? So then what's your story? How would you tell your story? This is an example that, that I made up. So there's this, there's the see and hear part. So let's say in my world, um, in my, my work world, I believe that one of my coworkers is getting all the credit for my work and meets privately with my boss. Um, you know, when I, when we have all staff meetings, I hear them get congratulated a lot for things that like the team is doing that I feel like I've initiated and like, I get kind of panicky about that and, and kind of upset that I feel like somebody else is getting credit for my work. And, um, why would that be if, if somebody is, you know, meeting privately with my boss and I know that, what kind of story would I be telling myself? I might be telling my story, or myself the story that my coworker, um, A, wants credit for themselves, but, but what is that about me? What's the personal thing about me? Maybe they don't trust me. Maybe they are trying to like step on me as they move up. Maybe they think that I'm weak and they can do that. But if I speak up, I will look too emotional. I will look, you know, like that I'm that I'm too sensitive or that I'm paranoid at worst. And so then how do I feel about that? So here I'm telling my story to myself. I feel hurt. I feel worried. I, I'm probably pretty preoccupied with this. And so how might I act? I might be really quiet in staff meetings or or and or. I might, um, you know, like undermine this coworker. I might take cheap shots at them. I might be sarcastic. I might, you know, just like, I, or, or not just directly undermine them, like taking cheap shots at them in a, in a meeting, but like around them to other people. I might talk about them badly. And so this is about like, controlling your own story because, you know, if something is happening, what do you do with that information? So then how do we control that? Yeah. So I understood everything that you just said, mm -hmm. but why can't you just want to know? So you can. 
<laughs> this is how. <laughs> so, but this is all. This all happens. This can all happen really quick. What I just. And this is life. This is life, <laughs> right? This can happen at work. This can happen at home. This can happen on the board. And sometimes it can be hard to just approach somebody without without having the tools to do that, right? Because you could just approach somebody, and I could just approach my coworker and be like, hey, are you trying to take credit for what I'm doing? But how might that conversation <laughs> go? How might, how might that go? Or, or like, hey, are, you trying, are you trying to undermine me? I mean, how might that conversation go? I mean, if I did it in a moment of anger, I could say it going one way. If I did it in a moment of fear, it would go another way. You know, like how might I set up myself to best, to make that conversation go the best? Because this all leads up to then, how do we set up ourselves to have those good conversations? And I think, you know, this happens in groups, it happens on boards as well. So the first thing, you know, this is about like being self-aware too. Like, okay, so we notice our behavior. Like, okay, how am I acting? If I notice myself shutting down in meetings, if I've noticed myself gossiping about this person or talking about them differently or or doing that, so showing my own lack of safety, crossing my arms, looking at them funny, you know, doing something that I don't normally do, um, noticing my own behavior and acknowledging how I feel about it. Okay, maybe I do feel scared. Maybe I do, maybe I'm a little paranoid. Maybe I do worry about, you know, my future at my job because somebody else, I feel I'm worried that they are doing something to undermine me. And then I need to question that because my anxiety about something isn't necessarily the truth. So can we be our own questioners? And can we say, so, oh, all right, so I, I feel that way, but is that, do I have evidence for that yet? Or have I talked to this person yet? Have I, you know, verified that yet? Do I have any data to show that? And not confusing stories with facts. So I think that's, that's one thing when we get into tough conversations in life, in work, and on the board, it is. It can be easy to confuse stories with facts. So, and I, you know, I I hear this a lot from board, when when I do this with boards in small communities, right? I mean, like, <laughs> I don't I don't know about here, but like, you know, there there are stories. There's gossip. Things travel like wildfire, and you know, and a lot of times, no, <laughs> and a lot of times there's stories, but not. And so we can't confuse stories with facts. And then there are three things to sort of watch for um, in ourselves, right? First is that none of this is my fault. I am the victim in this. None of, none of this is on me. And the next one is there's nothing I can do. Like this person is just gonna take my job. They're gonna get me fired, whatever. There's nothing I can do. And then it's making them the, the villain. Like it, it's all my coworkers fault. Like he's just a terrible person and you know, that it's that. So that's the, the self-referential part. And then the rest of the story is stating your path. So how do you get out of this, right? So let's say you want to have this conversation. This is the path through this conversation. And, and there's a whole section in this, in this book. And it's starting with sharing your facts. This is what I, this is what I have. Like, this is why we do the thinking about it beforehand and questioning what we're feeling, what we're going through, because we really want to get down to what is actually happening. Facts are least controversial. They're least insulting. So, you know, saying, you know, like, you've been a jerk or something like that, that's not a fact. <laughs> that's how I feel about it. But I have noticed you having meetings with our boss relatively regularly and or I have noticed that a lot of times in our staff meetings, you know, the work that the team is doing or the work that I have initiated has been attributed to you. I'm not making meaning of it yet. I'm stating a fact. And then to tell my story. So then I would, after that first part, start drawing reasonable conclusions, but I don't pile on. And before I go too deeply in that, I'm going to check for those safety issues. So my reasonable conclusion might be, you know, my, what I'm 
feeling about that is like I my conclusion is that's that's causing me some worry. That's causing me some worry. I mean, in in this situation, um, it is the the story is not a conclusion that I would come to that like you're evil and you're trying to get me fired. But the story, the conclusion is that I'm a little bit nervous about my job, or I'm a little bit nervous about you know the why behind this, and I'd like to investigate that some more. We take that really slowly, and then we check and make sure that the person is not shutting down on us. But then the next part is really asking, is really stopping to ask for a response from the other person. Okay, what is what is your reflection on that? Because we don't wanna keep just piling on to somebody. We wanna ask somebody else to share their facts and their stories. And then just a reminder that talk tentatively part the story part is a story that's not the hard fact. The hard fact in this case is, you know, you're having more meetings and this is what happens at staff meetings. The story about like, this is what I'm worried about, that's not the hard fact. But we also don't wanna like undersell and be like, I'm sure I'm wrong about this, but I also don't wanna come across too aggressively. And then encourage testing. Invite opposing, opposing views and mean it and um and you know play devil's advocate to find more of the story so like you know maybe maybe you mean this if somebody's not talking to you maybe you could offer the opposing view maybe you're just um maybe you're just trying to um to build relationship with our boss because maybe that's one of their answers could that be the case something like that and invite those you know opposing opposing views that's the way to make through that and then ex when when this book talks about exploring others past that really means expressing interest in other viewpoints and and meaning in and you know we talk a lot about you know i mean I, I know you've heard the term everybody talks about the term active listening and what we really mean by that that's kind of a term that nobody really hears anymore because it's it's too old and it's too overused but we talk about like really not just waiting to respond, but listening to understand, not just get done so I can start talking, but really expressing interest in that other person's viewpoint and acknowledging the things that they are demonstrating as they are talking. So that might mean out loud acknowledging like, okay, so I've talked to you about my concern. I can see that really frustrated you. Or I can I can see that 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 this conversation is is really upsetting to you, which is something you might do that we talk about when you get like if somebody from the community complains to you in the grocery store about some decision that the board made. You know, we've talked about how you can hear with empathy and yet not, you know, confirm or deny, you know, or accept and say, hey, you're right. You can say, hey, you know, I, I hear that really frustrates you. Checking for understanding is really important. This is what I heard you say, so that you're on the same page. Um, if no one is talking, taking a guess at what's going on and letting them respond. Um, you know, sitting in silence for a minute can be okay because then it's not just like you know you're you're talking, talking, talking. But you know, maybe making a guess. Hey, I I, I hear where you know, the conversation has stopped. Uh, might you be? thinking about this, or I'm wondering if maybe this is a tough conversation to have, or I'm wondering if maybe you don't feel safe in this conversation, or I'm wondering if this is a bad time kind of thing. Um, when views are shared, this is really important. It's really important to keep establishing common ground. So when you find something that you agree on, express that like out loud. Okay, sounds like we agree on this, so that can be set aside. Um, build on agreements, that's kind of the same thing. When things are left out, you're gonna take what you agree on and keep scaffolding that up. And then comparing two views instead of calling out someone as, as wrong. So even if they are wrong and facts are different, it's important to look at, okay, here's what I think, here's what you think, you know, let's, um, and, and you can go back in these steps too, right? Like, so you're comparing two views. Instead of saying, I'm right, you're wrong, is there any part in this in which we agree? Going back to that agree piece and then building on those agreements.
there are lots of ways to make decisions. And a lot of this, these are sometimes directly related to board work. Um, and sometimes they are more appropriate uh, between, you know, in interpersonal relationships and then in group relationships. Um, sometimes this is, this is often really applicable to the kinds of decisions that superintendents make versus the kinds of decisions that boards make. Um, we also use this to remind boards that, you know, individual board members don't get to make decisions, but, you know, command is when we turn over the decision to someone else. Um, that is often what the board delegates the superintendent to do. Um, consult is when decision makers invite others to influence them before making a decision. So that is a lot of, that's collaborative decision making, right? You hear from your community a lot of the times, you hear from your superintendent a lot of the time to, um, and, and you know, superintendent's team, your educational experts before you make a decision. And your superintendent does that too. Gary was just saying that, like, you know, having having cabinet and folks around and the other staff um, is a good influence before making a decision. Vote, of course, that is the bedrock of what you do. Um, and the team must support the will of the team afterward. That is all in this book as well. And then consensus, there are pros and cons to this. So it can be used in high stakes and complex issues and everyone must support the will of the team. Sometimes consensus can be really hard to come to because that means that everybody has to come to the same decision. So like there's, you know, there, I mean, it's, it's easier to vote, <laughs> but um, consensus can take a long time. That's one of the cons, um, but you know, it can be used in, in bigger decisions, um, but everyone has got to get behind it. And because you got to you know, come to essentially um, an everyone agrees kind of thing. Okay, we can keep going. So talking about all of these things, I mean, that goes through a bunch of stuff you haven't read yet, but I wanted to give you a big overview of the kinds of things you're gonna read and the kinds of things that you can use as tools. I will provide this to you, what I just shared, because also there's gonna be a little homework at the end of this. It's on the board books. Oh, it's on board books? Okay, you've already got it. Um, how can, how do you think that some of this can translate to the boardroom? How many? How many what? How many of these things are just, there's, there's been times where um, we'll just say, Gary and I completely disagreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And escalated. So I can I can see now, and because I have Andrew on my side, <laughs> that you know, I can see things like let's let's hold on here for a minute. Mm -hmm. This this is how I'm feeling, but let me hear how you feel. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, we are five people, five different personalities and everything. She's been a poor show. Right? You have one judge that in many different courses. So it's tense, mm -hmm. you know, just listening to each other, hearing each other, knowing that just one person isn't right. Maybe four of these people are not right. Mm -hmm. Okay. But together, we can come together and make a decision for the good of our district. Mm -hmm. I think if one thing we're good, mm -hmm. if we all agree on the same thing, I don't think we'd be making the best decisions for the kids. So being able to work through those differences, clearly communicating, respectfully communicating, is going to be big. Mm -hmm. It's going to be big. Mm -hmm. I think one thing I underutilized and just reminds me there, but it's really important, is paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Andrew might say something to me. And Maybe even if Andrew had listened to it back, he might go, oh, I can see how you got that. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to mess with the speaking. So I think, it's, I think it is important. We could probably use that a lot more. Um, this is what I hear you saying. Is that right? Well, it's, it's almost right. Here's where you're off. This isn't what I think. Mm -hmm. I think having that dialogue more often can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think it's very common as, as a listener that you're so caught up in what you're going to say next that you don't always hear them. At all, if not clearly. Right. So actually, like putting what you're going to say next on pause and intentionally listening, and then be like, okay, and then responding because responding right away is 
Yeah, you have to think about it. Mm -hmm. Internalize it. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and that's, you know, part of the reason that this, this book talks about, you know, when you're having that, that tougher conversation, you know, getting into, okay, here, here are the facts as, as, here are the facts that are, are facts sharing some of your story and then stopping there and asking for somebody else's response before you go on, right? Before you go into like, and then this, and then this, and then this, right? Because we can put somebody on the defensive so quickly. And also like, as soon as we feel piled on, we stop listening, like that's done. If somebody like, you know, starts piling onto me and accusing me of all kinds of stuff or whatever, like I'm going to stop listening, that's going to be it. And I will not hear the rest of what they're saying. Um, so, so really taking that break after that, that first little share and checking in with that person and seeing what they're, and if, and if, you know, and if it's your group and you're doing this, then you're going to use that reflection also and like, okay, well, here's what I heard you say. And you're going to be checking in with that as well. Um, I don't know if it's the right strategy, but like oftentimes when I'm preparing for a group of parents wants to meet with me to have a conversation about an issue or problem, they it isn't so much of a conversation as just four or five people mm -hmm. giving information, and it, and it does become difficult. The way I help myself is just to take notes. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm okay. There was something there. I, I'm not writing my response or what I think about it, but just a statement that. That I want to come back to. Yeah. So after I've had 15 minutes of just being talked out, you know, I've got a good outline. Of, I don't need to interrupt them and you know fire back my things. I can go to my notes. Okay, this is the things I've heard and what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. So what I will ask you to do for homework is I'll go to the next slide in a second because I'll have you answer the questions on the next slide. I'll ask you to read chapters three and four and then in chapter four is that style under stress test and take that because you'll, you'll be discussing that next. And then so in the last part, the questions on the next slide are... Um, that's okay. So what, what I like, um, teens to talk about is, you know, think, and you can, you can do this in advance. You can obviously come up with this in advance, you know, because this is why I'm giving this to you. What has been your most positive team experience? And if it's this team, that's great, but I'm talking about in your whole life. So think about, you know, for your whole life, what was your most positive team experience? and be prepared to describe that, not just name it, but describe it. Um, and then and then the why of that too, what made it so positive? What made that a positive team experience? Um, I would want you to talk about what's the best thing about being on the board. And, um, and really like, because I'm giving these to you in advance, um, I would ask that that answers be, you know, a little longer than just, you know, a sentence. Um, but what really is the best thing about being on the board? Um, then the, you know, the, the opposite of that, what is the most challenging thing about being on the board? Um, thinking really deeply about the next one, what is a goal that we are all working toward? And I would ask that this not necessarily be about big district goals. So I'm gonna challenge you to use something other than an easy target. Like an, an easy mark would be, oh, we've got this big district goal here, everybody's working toward that. A mission. A mission <laughs> right, exactly. Mission statement would be easy. But I mean you as a team. So you as a team. What are, what are you as a team trying to accomplish and trying to do? So what is a goal that you are all working toward as a team? And then how does your communication as a board speed your process or slow your process? And sometimes it's both. It can be a both and.
And you want folks to bring this next time or send it to you? Yeah, just bring it. You can bring it next time. You don't have to send it to me. Yeah. Just bring all of those and be prepared to discuss those. Because that's what we'll and then and then we'll also reflect on chapters three and four. So we'll re we'll reflect on chapters three and four. We'll talk about your style under stress um results, and then we'll answer these questions. And you've got these in four book, which is right, so you'll we'll have those. I'm sure you want a little bit of a break before your 6.30, but is there any questions or anything else that you want to discuss or reflect on before your 6.30 meeting? Folks might be arriving. So, Mark, you said that you can already get this somewhere? On board books. On board books? And is that, I can just type these up and email them to you. Thank you, Seth, on the You can print the PDF. I can do that. Yeah. Or you just say the PDF. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you need or anything else you wanted to? Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Thanks for reading. Thanks for doing your homework. And um, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Yeah, we've got on the calendar. Yeah. Is it December? Next, next month is, I think, December. I think it's December. Yeah. I'll, I'll confirm yeah. that. Yeah. We've got it. I'll see it at the conference. Oh, yeah. How many, yeah. how many of you are going to convention? Yeah. All right. See you at convention. That feels like it's in a minute. Right. Just a minute. It is, actually. It is. <laughs>
We have to make sure we need an important school district to provide investment for every student so that each of you can get great potential. Thank you to the members of the public who have joined us as a line of school board meetings and work sessions from 18 particular county public, providing an opportunity to share the discussions and actions. In an effort to conduct official board business, we ask the audience to be, to be respectful and refrain from questions, comments, and unnecessary noise while the board conducts the meeting. There is an opportunity for citizen comments tonight, and the board look forward to hearing from those who have signed up. I will share some reminders when we get to that portion of the meeting. Also, please note that the board meetings are live streamed and posted on the school board area of the website. And we'll begin with our first session presented by Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Hello. It's good to be here, and I am honored to be able to present the citizen award to Kara Casper. I'll just do it like that so I can see it. Come on up, Kara. And myself for you. Kara has a reputation for helping out all over the school. She volunteers to assemble materials and keep our classrooms tidy daily. Kara rises to the top in all pillars of character and sets a great example for other students. That was from Ms. Martin. And then Kara has been learning how to put up the American flag and the Oregon flag. She knows how to show the flag respect and hold it in the proper way. She has trained other students with how to do this as well. She helped lower the flag to half staff to respect the lives lost in the 9-11 attack. She is an example to her class and to those in our school. And that was from me. And the last one is Kara is a very responsible and respectful student. She always, and that's a big word, many of us could not even do that by always. She always gives her best efforts, and she can also work with anyone, and that's from Mrs. Green. So congratulations. <laughs> I pledge to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right along, and you're going to turn it to the Yes, yeah, so all good Castle in this grand We have one of our host moms here. Uh, we invited the exchange students to come tonight. Several of them have stopped doing with other activities. So, I think any of them are here. But uh, we'll get word back to them that any board meeting throughout the year, if they wanted to stop by at the beginning, we'll introduce them to you. But uh, Ms. Vandercar will tell us their names and their countries they're from. So my last name, um, I've learned that uh, they told me that I don't even get close. So we're going to go with first names. <laughs> and um, we have soccer, football, and volleyball. And uh, what they asked me is Monday is not a good night for them. So maybe you could change your dates. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, we have Erica from, do you want to introduce your team? Because I know you could get their names correctly. <laughs> Sure. Okay. <laughs> so we have Tressa who has two kids at her um, home. So we have Erica from Moldova. Uh, Lordy's, is it Lordy? Lordy. Lordy. Lou. Oh, I like Lordy. that. Lou <laughs> from Spain. And um, you have Lucas Corsten from Germany. 
and Donna Smaic from Bosnia. And that Maic starts with an S, so that's why I couldn't get it. And then Lennox from uh, Germany. So uh, what I heard from Trust is they're very interested in coming and meeting you and maybe telling you a little bit about where they're from. So we can try again. We did try really hard for this one, but um, maybe next time we can do it before season starts for the next section. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So next up on our agenda is our student representative representatives of um, the board. So we are also So basically, you can stay together. Not to mention the name in the appropriate place, and we'll just read it out. Exactly. Or you can choose to do one or the other. One goes first, you yeah, decide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big decision, right? Might be easier. Okay, okay. okay. You want to start first? I'll start there. Uh, shall I say my full name? Yeah, raise your right hand. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I from Bahia Riso, will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States, the state of Oregon and the lack of thereof, and the policies of the Thorn Ridge School District, and will discharge the duties of student representatives to the Thorn Ridge School Board to the best of my ability. I, JT Myers, will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States, the state of Oregon and the laws thereof, and the policies of the Thorn Ridge School District. And will discharge the duties of student representative to the primary school board to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just sign that piece of paper and give it to your team. We'll move on to our comments and um, the. School board, the primary school board, and the public input. A person wanting to provide a public comment will need to complete and submit an intent to speak form to the board secretary by 1 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. Public comment is limited to this place on the agenda, not to exceed a total of 30 minutes for all commenters. A person giving public comment is limited to an established time limit of three minutes. While speakers may during public meeting offer objective criticism of the school operation and programs, the board will not hear personal complaints concerning district personnel nor against any person connected with the school district. Please state your name and if you are a resident of the district, if speaking for an organization, state the name of that organization. The board reserves the right to refer the matter to their administration. And we'll start with Jason. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Olansky. I'm a parent of a child in the district and two graduates. I'll begin by thanking the parent who gave comment last month in defense of the safety of trans students. Your concern for this marginalized group is commendable and it was very brave of you to speak publicly on the subject. While your recommendation of separate but equal facilities was reminiscent of pre-civil rights court cases, at least you were magnanimous enough to suggest that the transgenders shouldn't have to change in a broom closet. Also, thank you, Board Member McCann, for your support of the speaker. I hope your legacy on this board is first and foremost as an ally to the trans community. Despite the well-meaning support last month, I was concerned and confused by the idea of increasing the safety of our students by participating in a Kansas lawsuit. There must have been a misunderstanding as a quick search revealed that one of the plaintiffs in this lawsuit, Moms for Liberty, is a group that the Southern Poverty Law Center called a far-right extremist organization that engages in anti-inclusion activities and is in opposition to LGBTQ plus and racially inclusive curriculum and has advocated book bans. Further reading revealed that the purpose of this lawsuit is explicitly to strip protections from trans students as an on-ramp to do the same to all LGBTQ groups. I would suggest that instead of participating in frivolous lawsuits and political grandstanding, we enact some actual common sense measures in our schools. Stalls or curtains that create private changing areas and increase the locker room supervision are recommended by the state of Oregon and the Federal Department of Education. 
These would be low cost solutions that would retain the dignity of trans students while ensuring the safety of all students, which we have already agreed is what we all want. A quick note on safety, there is no evidence available that shows a correlation between allowing students to choose their restroom and decreased safety of anyone. There are, however, many cases that tie restrictive gender policies to increased cases of assault and sexual crime. Once again, we have all agreed that safety is the only reason we are talking about this today. If we really care about student safety, the discussion needs to be driven by facts rather than hurt feelings, fear, or hate. Ultimately, I'm here tonight to ask that the board condemn the group Moms for Liberty and dismiss their desire to politicize our children and their education. I believe that it is in my child's best interest that groups that literally quote Hitler in their newsletters do not have any participation in our educational system. I'm not being hyperbolic, that actually happened. It is up to all of us to send a message that hate does not belong in our schools, on this board, or in our community. Thank you. My name is Jolene Dugan, and I have a child in the Fern Ridge District. Um, I'm here tonight to urge the board to support the district in providing a safe and welcoming environment for LGBTQ plus youth. I share Mr. Alansky's concern for the safety of our students, and I agree with his ideas for common sense measures to support the dignity of trans students while maintaining the safety for all students. Using common sense and kindness can bring us a long way towards resolving these issues. After hearing last month's speaker, however, I have to ask, does this board think it's okay to use other people's children as pawns to push a personal agenda, like we heard at last month's meeting during an appalling anti-trans tirade thinly veiled as concern for a trans student's safety? Does this board think it's okay to put a target on the child's back? For that matter, does this board think it's that, that what the district wants or needs is the outside influence of the politically motivated extremist hate group Moms for Liberty? Because that's what a few parents in our district are trying to bully you with by unilaterally signing up our schools to be part of the Kansas lawsuit and telling you that you were not allowed to protect trans students from discrimination. Fortunately, that lawsuit does not prevent our district from following its own anti-discrimination policies, nor from following ODE guidance, and thankfully has no real impact on Oregon districts. I'd like to remind the board that failing to uphold anti-discrimination policies in defiance of state guidance puts you one civil liberties lawsuit away from financially crippling this district. And if you'd like to see what it looks like when extremists take over a school board and try to push LGBTQ students back into the closet, just take a look at what's happened in the Newburgh district here in Oregon. I'm sure none of you would wish for the lawsuits that their board members and district have been embroiled in lately. And spoiler alert, it has not worked out well for the extremist board members. Finally, I would like to ask you to consider these words from a county resident who gave me permission to read to you something they wrote. As a former trans youth and current trans adult, the shift that hate groups like Moms for Liberty spew towards trans kids is appalling. Trans kids are not trying to hurt or convert your children. They want to play sports, make friends, and navigate a complicated time in their lives, just like any other kid. Yet somehow, monsters like the Moms for Liberty, like the members of Moms for Liberty, want to strip away the already flimsy protections in place for children who are statistically more likely to attempt suicide, not simply because they are trans, but because of how they are treated by the world for being trans. Growing up in a, a trans in a world where people are actively working to chip away at your safety and rights is traumatizing. It already hurts when you are an adult with an understanding of the world. When shit like this is targeting trans youth, it is teaching them just how much the world seems to hate them just for existing. For that is really Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
I do want to the, the next one that I have to do. So you want to go to work? Second. in a second. Are there any discussions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Are you ready? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear us? I do. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, this is our October 1st um, enrollment report. Our in-district enrollment is at 1,290, which is six over our budgeted numbers. Um, at the elementary level, we are up two, and we are up 23 at the middle school level, and we are down 19 at the high school level, according to our budgeted numbers. Um, we also have nine more out-of-district placements than what was projected in the budget. Um, both elementary schools are sitting around average class sizes of 23, Elmira is at 22.64, and Benita is at 23.64. Um, that is all I have on the enrollment report, unless the board has any questions. All right. If not, I'll move on to the financial report. You have a question. So I just wanted to ask a quick question. As far as um, students coming in and students going out of the district, um, do you have those numbers? Um, I do. I can pull those up. One second. Are you just looking for the total numbers? One sec. Okay, so um, we had um, 55 um, students transfer out with three returning um, from that 55, and then we had 37 transfer in and one withdrawal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's it for the questions. Okay, you ready for the financial report? Yes. All right. Um, so at the last meeting, I was asked to provide further detail on the revenues. So I have amended the general fund revenue section of the financial report to provide that further detail um, on how the revenue is classified. Uh, so Oregon requires districts at a minimum to record revenues by five major sources, which include local sources, intermediate, state, federal, and then other sources. And then within each of those five major sources, um, districts can use subcategories, which is what we do and most districts do in Oregon. Um, so I kind of listed those out. Our local source subcategories in the order shown are property taxes, transportation fees, earnings on investments, extracurricular activities, rentals, donations, leases, prior year revenue, grant fees, and miscellaneous revenue. Um, the miscellaneous revenue, um, that could include library fees, um, E-rate rebates, or other small revenue that doesn't fit into any of the other classifications I listed. Um, our intermediate source subcategories include the county school fund, the ESD revenue, and other intermediate sources. Um, currently, the only thing going into other intermediate sources is the heavy equipment tax, which is fairly new. I think it began last year or the year before. Um, it's not a significant amount of money, but that's where we're required to put it. Um, and then we have our state source subcategories, which includes the state school fund, the common school fund, and the state managed timber, and any restricted state grants. But typically, 
grants are kept in the special revenue, not in the general fund revenue. Um, there may be times where the ODA requires you to keep it in general funds, so that's where it would go. Um, our federal sources come from federal forest fees. That's about the only time you see federal in the general fund. And then other sources would include transfers in from other funds, which rarely happens, or minor sales of fixed assets, such as a mower, mower part or something along those lines. Um, also, our beginning fund balance is actually considered as an other source, but that is reflected at the top of the revenues on our financial report, not in that specific order, um, just because that's kind of where we start out. However, that doesn't get recorded until our audit's done, which is, you know, has been delayed the last couple of years. So um, that's kind of a breakdown of the revenues that get put into the general fund. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I know Lisa, you were the one that asked about it. Did you have any questions? Thank you so much for doing that. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Just um, the federal forest fees are deducted from the state school fund, right? Right. It, that is part of the state school fund formula, just like the property taxes. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, so on that note, um, we've received 23% of our budgeted revenue. Last year, we were at 27%. Um, but like I mentioned at the last meeting, we had received a very large um, timber revenue payment. So our revenue was quite high last year at this time um, due to that. And then we have spent 13% of our operating expenditures, which is the same exact percent we were at um, last year. at this time. So does the board have any questions on any of that? No, thank you. Okay. I'll move to approve the uh, financial report for September 30th, 2024. We'll second. I'll second. We'll have a motion and a second. Any discussions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then we have the proposed 2025-26 budget out of here. Yeah, so this is our proposed 25-26 budget calendar. Um, nothing's changed on it from prior years. Um, I kind of just, you know, moved the dates, but they're around the same weeks as usual. Um, I don't think there's any significant changes. I move to accept the 25-26 budget calendar as presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. All right. We're going to move on. High school now. Um, to our student representative. Um, our first issue is the thing that we have is homecoming week. Um, our test items um, for homecoming week, we held a big spirit assembly in preparation for the game. Um, the seniors won every game in the assembly. <laughs> um, in this assembly, we got introduced to some of the game shears by the cheerleaders. Um, we also recognized all the EHS clubs, groups, groups and sport teams. The cheerleaders also put in a performance, and the football team showed out the first play they planned for the game. Um, after we also had a parade. The senior class won the overall competition and they won the parade as well. <laughs> <laughs> and during the game, we crowned Malay Tutora as royalty during class time. 
uh, the day after, we held a dance in the cafeteria, and it was a uh, masquerade thing. Uh, we had a big turnout, uh, 271 ticket sales, and during this week, we felt like it has been the most spirited EHS has been in a while. Awesome. I think it was one of the biggest turnouts we've had for dance since COVID. Yes. Well, we Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, over the last three weeks, football has been on a little bit of a win streak. Uh, they started the year rough, I think, losing four straight games, but uh, they've now won three since then. Uh, that started against Pleasant Hill on homecoming night, so that was nice timing. Uh, and then we played an away game at Madras, and then a home game against Lapine for senior night. Uh, the team is working hard to keep that streak up for the remainder of the season. We need going to play Harrisburg and Cottage Grove. Uh, we also, last week, uh, the cross-country boys team of uh, sophomore Thad Mason, junior Jake Van Dam, and senior Jude Carmen won the day's Crate 3 by 3000 relay. Uh, Jude won as a ninth grader, uh, placing first for Elmira, and then uh, he got to return as a senior this year and get the second win for our school at that relay. In addition to sports, National Honor Society held the annual Bud Black Drive. Um, it was successfully uh, done and we collected 23 donations. Um, in addition to that, college fair and we had a college fair where juniors and seniors interested were able to go to the University of Oregon. Uh, the students were dismissed during second period and we all broke together. I said, I and uh, we all drove together in a school bus. And universities have also been holding meetings at the AHS for interested juniors and seniors as well. Uh, we had the University of Oregon and uh, come here October 3rd. Uh, Oregon State came October 17th, and Western Oregon University was here today. Um, as far as what we've been getting going in uh, EHS, uh, our leadership class has been kind of getting on a steady track. Uh, with homecoming being as soon as it was in the beginning of the year, our class wasn't quite operating as we preferred it to, and it wasn't as official as we hoped. Uh, it was just very chaotic. Uh, but now we are having two official meetings a week. Uh, with uh, each class and committee like presenting uh, a report of their plans and things we're trying to get going. Um, hopefully, as we continue to experience these board meetings, we'll be able to take back what we've learned and mirror it in our school board meetings. Um, we're aiming to start some new projects around EHS, but we're still only like in the discussion phase. One of our uh, big things that we're looking forward to is like getting uh, like seasonal decorations around the school just to like, keep it a little more lively and not fair as it has been. Uh, right now we have state testing. It will be happening October 30th. Uh, we'll take the Wednesday until lunch and all students will remain in their homerooms taking the test. Um, leadership hopes to start putting motivational messages around the school as well as in social media for students. Um, as we talk last school uh, as meeting, we will have seniors taking the SATs and other groups taking the versions of it. Yeah. Uh, we're now getting into all of our fall sports seasons wrapping up. Like I mentioned, football only has two weeks left. Um, on October 30th, cross country goes to districts. Uh, Jude uh, Carmen placed last year and was able to go on to state. Uh, we have Jake Van Dam that may be in the mix since he's been running pretty close to Jude, but that just depends how the league uh, shakes out. Uh, for the football senior night, they we played against Lapine and they won 55 to 10. It was a, a nice send off with the, the boys since that is also the, the plans go through like that should be the last game played on that field because it's looking to get the new uh, field put in at a different location. Uh, senior night for boys and girls soccer was today. Uh, boys have one more game in their season at a neutral site near Grants Pass. And then the girls will have two more games uh, all at home, but they didn't have their senior night later because the senior night was scheduled before these games were 
Um, and then volleyball held their senior night and last game against sisters on Thursday, uh, where they honored three of their seniors. Uh, now, we also have uh, National Honor Society will start their annual Adopt a Family, where a high school student has the opportunity to create a fundraiser and take donations to give to the community during the holiday. <laughs> In addition to this, we have uh, Powder Pop, uh, where juniors and senior girls are beginning to prepare to compete against each other, um, and the game will be November 15th. Uh, well, that's happening. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So how rigged were those homecoming competitions? Oh, it's just uh, uh, I'm a senior. <laughs> I'm a junior homecoming teacher. So. <laughs> I think most days in like spirit. No, you guys days. did well at this. But, uh, <laughs> as far as the competitions, I think we just picked the better, uh, the better students. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, October. I can't believe it's November. Soon. All right, so again, we're all on to all my elementary. Um, maybe, yeah. Okay, uh, so two of the students taught the new chant at the Beagle, Beagle's Nest morning meeting, um, which is be safe, be responsible, be respectful, and kind. Go Eagles. And then on the right hand side, fourth and fifth graders have the opportunity to apply for various jobs. Um, so whether that's helping with a flag or in the library, computer lab, um, but these responsible eagles are great leaders. So that's the first slide. Uh, the other slide with Elmira Elementary. That's a pretty float. Yeah, they had a lot of fun with their float, lots of candy, lots of school spirit. Um, but that, yeah, it was a really cool float. I still think Mrs. Perry or maybe should have been the one slimed on the right hand side. <laughs> uh, <laughs> their slime fundraiser raised over $2,700, which helps out with their various like attendance days and school store. And the two lucky recipients, I don't know if that's so lucky, but they brought in the biggest donations, Miss Trish and Mrs. Kenyon. So there's the picture of them getting slimed. <laughs> <laughs> and then over at Benita, they had their jump a thon, and I thought, you know, raising over ten thousand dollars that's awesome. Uh, they had the top jumper over 400 jumps in three minutes, probably under three minutes. And the new principal, which you guys saw earlier tonight, she decided to join in and she got close to 100 uh, jumps in, so that was pretty cool. And then just the leaderboard that has the different jumps um, and how they did. And then the other slide that they shared is that October is Bully Bullying Awareness Month, and that cows helped provide them with beautifully hand painted posters of Kelso's choices, which are all over the walls. Um, outside on the playground to make it easier for kids to see and use during conflicts. And it just explains how Kelso's Choice is a conflict management curriculum for children between the grades K through five. Um, it just teaches children how to identify and solve small problems on their own and when to reach out to adults uh, if they have bigger problems. And then she just shared how one of the fourth grade classes had created some anti-bullying posters to kind of just display throughout the school. So just a reminder about being kind to one another. I think we've heard that theme multiple times now and it goes through all the grade levels, K through 12, it's just really important. Just be respectful, be kind. All right, on to the middle school. <laughs> I, I like their flow too. Uh, so they had their Fill the Cauldron uh, fundraiser, which I can't exactly read. Uh, on that slide, uh, just raising funds for various activities. Um, but they've raised $1,000 so far. Uh, and then they were just sharing one of their school spirit days that they had today there. And then they just 
So, you know, I guess their first dance is this coming Friday. Uh, I inquired more about the ghost suckers because originally it was just like ghost suckers. And I was like, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about them? So I think it's similar to what the high school, like around Valentine's Day when they make the candy grounds, they have these ghost suckers that are going to be passed out on Halloween and is kind of led by the leadership class. And then next Wednesday, this is actually for staff, but we are having like a wellness Wednesday in the middle school wanted to share their hosting, like they're hosting the cozy reading with hot chocolate for staff. I know the high school is doing like badminton and pickleball. Um, we have a retirement one that's being offered and then an art one. So each school is gonna have a different location and it's like a two hour, hour and a half, two hours that staff will just get to do some wellness. So I said, and then just some from the high school, which I know Fern and JT already shared some, but we had our spirit days football game. I like that picture with the scoreboard and I'm looking up at it. Uh, and then with the dance and then the homecoming court uh, at the football game. Um, so just some of the spirit days and then just some stuff that's been going on in the classroom. Uh, the advanced auto class working on their truck and then AP Lit students, which you can see JT in there, uh, analyzing some poetry for figurative language. Are you in there too, for? Oh. <laughs> and then in psychology class, uh, Mrs. Wright Brendan held a sensory fair um, and students, and she even invited other classes to come in and just try out some different tests for senses like smell, taste, vision, hearing, and the balance system. Uh, so that was just a really fun activity where students got to just kind of experience the sensory there. And that is it for a month. Thank you. Hey, you guys don't even. <laughs> <laughs> I'll email it to you. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have two things for you guys. The first one is an annual report um, that if you've been here as long as SIA is going, that's something that I have to do every year. Essentially, throughout the entire year, we report quarterly on our budgeting and our activities and our progress markers. But then once a year, you get to report to the board on two narrative questions. So hopefully you guys feel more involved than just the two narrative questions since we do a lot of updates, but go ahead to the next slide. It's a requirement. Um, yeah. Next slide. So this will hopefully looks somewhat familiar. Remember the four common goals for the student investment account SIA is well-rounded education, equity advanced, engaged community, and strengthen district systems and capacity. So you can only use the money for very particular things, student health and well-being, professional development, um, well-rounded learning opportunities. And then the bottom part kind of just shows how we check our progress, whether it's through progress markers, the longitudinal um, performance growth targets, and then reporting. And then also things like high school success, uh, CTE Perkins, early literacy, they kind of all fall under the integrated programs. Go ahead. So then what we have to do is throughout the year, we review our own progress. Um, I share that with you guys. I share that with our admin team. We talk about our progress on our longitudinal performance growth targets. I've updated our board. You know, we kind of just try to make everything really aligned and focused. And so this year, it's really about reviewing our progress towards meeting our goals on the LPGTs. And we'll have an opportunity to adjust those because like I mentioned, 25, through 27 is our next application window, so I'll, we'll apply for that. Uh, so then there's two questions, essentially, and they're pretty loaded questions, so it's hard to try to make them, you know, um, not just a bunch of jargon, but to really be thoughtful in the work that we're doing and where we're at. So the first one, essentially, it's talking about, like, what are we doing well? Where have we seen good progress? And the things that... The data that I use is our school-wide district data. I use our community input surveys, our student staff input surveys, um, and just the work that we're doing in the buildings every day. So where we're doing well, something that I feel like is significant is just this maintaining high expectations and promoting a K-12 focus. We've really aligned our mission and vision. We've really 
make sure that the money that we're spending, the professional development that we're doing is falling under this particular category. Um, sometimes Mr. Carpenter doesn't feel like I keep it aligned. I'm all over the place, but it's aligned, Mr. Carpenter. Um, so that's going really well. The professional learning that's happening, the data teams, the just really intentional focus on student learning has felt really good. We've made a lot of progress there. So then the next slide is just some of the work that we've done in that area. So right now we have 16 teachers completing a letters training, which is a very intensive program for teaching students how to read. And it's a no easy lift. Like they committed a lot of time and energy over the last eight months to complete it. So that's a big deal. We have 10 elementary staff working on a district implementation leadership team for responding to instruction and intervention when students are not doing well. We have K-5 data teams in place. We started a high dosage tutoring program this year with our early literacy success dollars, which essentially is high dosage tutoring is um, one licensed teacher working with a very particular program with no more than three kids at a time, at least three days a week for at least 30 minutes. So it's very intensive and great that we have these extra grant dollars that we're able to provide that. And then we've got after school programs. The middle school, we've started star math and reading. They have a new science curriculum. They're starting data teams at their level. Um, after school programs, they've been working with ODE and working on creating a plan and structure for OSAS interim assessments, which is a lot of work. Again, just the work that people are putting into trying to do better for kids and refine their craft has been awesome. At the high school level, they have their ninth grade on track committee, which is, um, I would, I've visited at least once over the last couple of years just to see it in action. And it's pretty amazing. The teachers come in, they, they're ready to talk about kids, how to help them, what they can do. Um, targeted supports for on-time graduation, college now courses, AP courses, test day, which you've heard all about, the CTE classes that you saw a couple pictures, and then just the student input surveys, trying to really understand what's going well for kids and what we can do better. So that was question one. Question two is where are we struggling or what's been like a barrier? So for us, the, the outcome of creating a supportive and safe school environment that values diversity in which all students and adults feel welcomed and respected. That has by far continued to come up in our student input surveys, our community surveys, that um, we still have a lot of room to grow with our mental health supports, bullying and how we're responding to it, racism within the schools and classrooms and how we respond to it. Um, and this is from like kind of a student perspective. The, the, at the building level or the district level, it may be getting responded to in a certain way, but it's the students' perceptions are still, there's a spectrum of need there. Um, so really needing to increase our intentional engagement and education around some of this stuff. Um, and so that's, it. it's just, I kind of put some of the, what's challenging is, you know, we're, we're a small rural community. We, we have not a ton of training in some of this work. We have limited resources and we have different influences. So really just being aware of those challenges, but then looking at the work that we are doing, it's a lot. Again, the teachers and the staff and the administrative team are working really hard. So K-12, we've got these counselors happening, which has been great. And that's been a huge reflection of SIA dollars. And that's definitely something that kids want and need and our families want and need. Um, Elementary levels have started morning meetings. We have lots of assemblies. We've been trying to do a lot of behavior support, social emotional learning. Both 6, 8, and 9, 12 have been working on like sources of strength and how to motivate and show caring and connection within their buildings, whether that's safe organ, whether it's bulletin boards or leadership groups, um, providing time and space for affinity groups, and then just really making sure that there's this there's family outreach and school climate. So, and then at the district level, we have our district equity team and we have the work that I help guide up and with. So that's, that's what's already submitted to the state on our two narrative questions. Do I have any questions? So that might be like uh, BIPOC. I think that's the only one we have going right now. Five mm -hmm. which is like so like a multiracial, 
like a black student union group, something like that. I think, but they have clubs, they have drama club. Um, and Ms. Snyder, what other affinity groups do we have at the high school? We have our BIPOC group. Is that our only one right now? I think so. Well, I do have a question. So when you say biracial group, mm -hmm. are you talking about there's a group and anybody can be in mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And you're not saying that we have a black group or white group baby. No, my pop group is open to anybody. But thank you. Okay, so that's the first report. All right, so the next one is a spotlight on literacy. So over the next few months, I'm going to try to focus some of the shared learning that's happening in the buildings and just a shared spotlight K-12. So this month is literacy because I wanted to talk a little bit more about early literacy and what they're doing K-5 with some of those extra dollars. And then um, moving on, just so you guys have to know what we're doing. Go ahead. So update the school board and community on literacy work happening K-12. You can keep going. These first couple slides are just literacy defined. Just what is literacy? The ability to read, write, and communicate effectively. Um, it's essential for academic success, critical thinking, lifelong learning. These are just kind of the reasons why folks on literacy. Hopefully, we don't have to have a huge conversation around that, but just all of the factors that help with lifelong learning and a successful um, career path. And literacy development, what that looks like. So there's the big five which is phonemic awareness, phonics, reading fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. And then I put an asterisk because writing skills falls under that too. And that's definitely an area that um, our district's looking to focus on because there, what happens is this pendulum and ebb and flow of, oh, we really need to focus here. And then you kind of like let one drop. And so trying to really find that focus, our middle school specifically, I know is going to do some work with writing. Um, K-5 literacy, just so you know, we have 90 minutes at least every day for every learner. The teams between both Benita and Elmira Elementary meet weekly. They have common agreements. They have pacing guides. They have small group norms. Um, the building admin team, we've done some walkthroughs. And so they have this document that they know what are, what are we looking for. We're looking for use of the curriculum. We're looking for all the same sound spelling cards, the weekly focus. Um, measuring progress, we are starting with STAR benchmarks, STAR Renaissance Learning this year, and that was something I talked a little bit about last month, and I'll talk even more about next month, because we've got our first fall benchmark data, which has been really exciting. We use that for progress monitoring, and then we also do interims. We have lots of extra supports in place, Eagle Time and Wind Time. Win stands for what I need, and so essentially it's that 90 minutes of poor reading, but then there's an additional 30 minutes that's for intervention and extension. So kids kind of do a walk to what they need, whether whatever it falls under. And then we have the high dosage tutoring that I talked about and the after school programs. That's all happening at K-5. The next slide talks about some of the professional learning. Again, that I talked about Oregon RTI, letters training, STAR, the PLCs. And then that early literacy grant is new to our district and to the state of Oregon as of last year. And we're using those dollars pretty intentionally with this high dosage tutoring program. So one to three students, um, at least three days a week, 10 week cycles, or at least 30 minutes each of those days. Six through eight, they are starting with their MTS multi-tiered systems of support for their data teams. They're using that star data and they have at least 50 minutes a day for ELA. They do individual conferencing with students. They are working on proficiency scales, targeted and explicit instruction. And then each of the teachers just shared a little blurb about what they're working on. Sixth grade um, is doing some narrative discussion and writing. Seventh grade, reading fiction, examining writer's craft. And then eighth grade, um, Mr. Davis wanted to share his focus those first couple of weeks has really been building strong relationships and jump starts in journaling. At the high school level, look, it's that same picture. Miss <laughs> um, Nelson took that picture for me, so I don't know if Jennifer stole it from me or Miss Nelson just shared it with both of us. To <laughs> double Nelson, double credit. <laughs> um, so she's got some writing 121 happening, English 3, journalism, AP Lit. Mr. Hart is talking about the work that he's doing and Miss Ehrman with 
some were English and mythology. So then the next slide just is a little bit, I, I know I talked a little bit about Star Renaissance last month and next month I'll give you even more, but just another little tidbit of one thing that it offers. So this is a picture of my dashboard. And when I go into my dashboard, once the assessments are done, I can go in and each of those little icons is a different report I can pull, whether it's um, where students are compared to the mastery of the state standards for the grade level that they're in, whether it's an instructional report or a planning report or a report for families or a proficiency report on how they'll do at this current time against the state benchmarks and state assessments. So it's very fancy. It's been really fun digging in and I'm excited to share some of those with you. Next month, I've got to figure out a way to, um, I want to share the reports in a way that I'm protecting students, you know, so I'm going to show some grade level data and some district data, but I also want to show examples of what we can look at all the way down to a student. So I'm still kind of playing around with that. But then this next slide is, again, one of my dashboards. So I can see how many students have tested in reading, how many we had do it in Spanish, whether they've done the Star Phonics screener, how many in math, and then CBMs are an additional assessment that you can do to dig even deeper. So we had some CBMs happening, and it's just really exciting. I mean, if you like data, which I do. <laughs> Um, so this is, again, these are just snippets. I won't explain them. Next month, I'll kind of go into what they're showing, but essentially this kind of shows you the percentage of benchmark and what these, what the reports will do for teachers, for administrators, um, for myself, is it kind of breaks down the proficiency level, whether they're at benchmark, whether they're on watch or, um, intervention or urgent intervention. And obviously what you want is a lot of green there. Um, I think one was reading and one was math, so you can just keep going. And so that's all I have for literacy. Next month, um, like I said, in November, we'll focus on our LPGT's presentation, and then I'll also throw in a whole bunch of different assessment, just district-wide data, based on our some really great data that we got released from the state a few weeks ago. Any questions on that? Okay. Yeah. Two things I'll go over real quick. Uh, one, after the last play reading, I listened to the audio because someone asked that it was hard to hear from home, so we've ordered a new audio setup in here. Um, but supply chain didn't make it for this meeting. Uh, so Paul Wall and GreenNet were actually using this device up here. We, they kind of tested it out, and uh, this, they thought it recorded uh, sound a little bit better. So we'll see what it looks like and sounds like tomorrow, but just know in the coming, hopefully by next month, We'll have a device that has kind of like a spider thing, something in the center, and then I think five or six microphones will give you out to each table so you can hear, hear you a little clearer. We're going to try that out. Uh, quick bond update this will probably happen every month. Um, lots happening, lots of meetings. Our bond oversight committee has met once, uh, Lisa's on that. Our planning group for the high school track complex uh, met once. And then today I had a virtual meeting with just the architects where they came back with their first examples of drawings. Um, we reviewed that. I gave them a lot of feedback. We're going to go back, make some adjustments, and then we're going to get, uh, we're checking in two weeks, and then we'll schedule the second meeting with that larger high school group to see what we came up with with their feedback. Um, we started the process to order our turf and track surface. Um, do a co-op that will probably happen around December-ish. Um, the Benita planning group met last week, I think it was. So just to recall, our two main projects at Benita are the gym floor and the restrooms over on the north wing um, in the, what's now currently the kindergarten area. Those are the two oldest restrooms. So. Um, those will both get renovated, outdated, along with the gym. So the first planning committee there, we got three teachers, three new parents. Uh, that went well. And then the next planning group was actually tomorrow. Um, I meet with a different architecture firm uh, that's doing the outside. We have one, we have one um, company, one group of architects that's doing the track complex. Another one that's doing all the inside of the three buildings. So the high school inside, 
uh, the primary project is the four science classrooms. Those will be gutted, um, updated, and rebuilt. Uh, so that first planning meeting with that group happens tomorrow. Those are really, well, there might be some act, other things happening. Those will be the three main projects in the summer of 25. We're breaking ground March 30th, March 30th, for sure, Monday, March 30th, 2025, on the athletic complex. First day schools out in June will be tackling the Benita inside of Athens Gym and in the high school um, science room. So that's kind of an update on things happening uh, with the bond. Last day, I mentioned this in one of my Friday updates uh, recently, but I want to get it on the radar here and get it in the minutes, noting that um, the event, we'll start with just the administrative team, but starting to look at either a boundary change or the discussion of K2, K5, um, both of those will be painful, uh, but I think it's necessary um, that we look at that. The primary reason is the students in the Elmira attendance area continue to drop, students in the Bonita attendance area continue to rise. Traditionally, while it fluctuates some, we have around 100 kids per grade level in our district. Uh, you can see we have, I think on today's report, it said we have 1290. That's 13 grades, K through 12. It's about 100 per, per uh, grade level. Typically, they've been broke up evenly. We have about 55 at one, 45 in the other, let's say in second grade, maybe the next year it's split. But the last three years, it's been pretty consistent um, in that we have about, uh, you know, going up averages, but for kinder, first and second grade, we have about 100 kids, but 65 of them are at Benita, and maybe 32 of them at Elmira. So, uh, two solutions to that. Um, and we've researched this all before. I've got tons of folders and information on the pros and cons. Um, we can change the boundary so that you know, you pick up and move the boundary. Okay, you were living in here and how you attend Elmira Elementary, or the other model we've looked at, um, which also has some downsides, it is one school will be K2, the other school will be K3 5. So I'm just getting it on your radar. I'm going to start to look at this, get some data, then probably bring some other people, some teachers, some classified staff, the unions, talk about this. Um, and at some point, we probably doing some sort of presentation to the board and providing a recommendation for one of those for the board that was away in. Um, so we're six months off, uh, but if we, and not that we have to do anything now, but I'm to the point now where I think we're being, um, uh, we're not looking at the future, we're not making this change now. Uh, the biggest reason is the, we've got three years now of K-1-2 at Elmira Elementary where they have low curves. And if that continues for the next three years, then that student population will be at 180 kids. Um, and we need to be over 400. And traditionally, they've been relatively even, but there is no new building on this site. The houses are typically not starter homes. They live acreage, they're bigger properties, less young kids. All the new homes are on the other side of uh, 126. More new kids there. So uh, just getting on your radar, I just want to talk about this. We'll obviously have lots of conversations. will definitely be something we engage the community in. Um, but we'll be hearing about that over the next six months. That's all I have. Mr. Holmes, um, I just wanted to ask with the restrooms, are what what phase are they in? Have they been in the design phase yet? No. Our architecture is getting uh are just getting feedback from folks. So some of the design things we talked about were um right now if you've been in those restrooms, they have a very uh a door entrance. Um but it's open, there's not a door on it. I just mean that width, and it kind of winds around the corner. We're probably going to more open, um, like they are at the, the newer elementary school, maybe the hand washing station outside. Uh, we're going to keep um, a boy and girl. Uh, however, we might, within each restroom, one of the things they talked about was having a single stall within each restroom. So if you've been to the new restrooms at high school, there's seven single stalls. I uh, just did one big space. Uh, one of the things that are considered going to consider is having one of those in each one of those restrooms. But mostly it'll just be about updating new fixtures and reconfiguring so it's, so it's more open. You can hear noises in there happening, you know, and less 
we found in elementary schools, all schools uh, have found that having where you wash your hands be a little more outside and more visible, results in less water on the floor and water fights and all that kind of stuff. So uh, they took all the feedback from the parents and the teachers. I mostly just listen. They're going away and kind of kind of draw some specifics and then we're gonna come back and share it. Okay. <laughs> For our discussion items, Division 22. We do this every year. I want you to pull up this document. There are, and every other year, it seems like we have one or two that we're out of compliance with. That was the case this year. Or obviously, what I'm referring to is last year. So it's 23 24, Division 22. There's 59 different things. Um, typically, over the summer, I'll start reviewing them. Not that I'm they'll keep them in mind throughout the year, uh, but making sure, you know, I I don't just go through and say, oh, yeah, I'm sure we're in compliance. I find out we're really actually in compliance with all of these things. Um, and so there's two items where I deem this out of compliance. We developed a plan, the plan's already been implemented. Um, I've already sent it off to OD. We're in compliance now. First one is on page five. So why don't you scroll down for that? I don't remember which one this was. Okay, right there. This was assessment of essential skills. So uh, there's a requirement that in grades three through 12, uh, teachers need to do work samples. Um, it, vary, it, it varies which subjects per grade level. Uh, we were in compliance um, elementary and middle school. However, at high school, um, the requirement there is that once in your high school career, you have to do a speaking work sample, um, a math problem solving, a science that are writing. And last year, it didn't take place in all of them. Uh, it only took place in science. I think some of the reasons for this were uh, some new teachers, certainly new principal, not understanding this requirement. Um, so we've, re we've gone back to a document from a few years ago that identifies whose responsibility is what. It's there linked. You don't need to click on it, but for example, um, speaking is going to always take place in with 10th graders in health class. So there'll be some topic that in health, uh, each year the 10th graders, that's where they're, where they will accomplish that. So um, that is an area we were out of compliance in last year, and we're back on track now. You go down to page nine. The second area was <laughs> health services. There's really two elements of this. One was Last summer, they created a new requirement that we needed to have what is called a health services plan. And we, had, we had elements of this. We really had all the elements of this in other areas, our communicable disease plan, board policy, all kinds of things. But the legislator passed a new requirement that I wasn't aware of at the start of the year um, around putting this all into one document. You scroll down a little bit further. Um, yeah, I'll look to it now, but if you want to read it, that's the document right there. Um, and I did that. I learned about this in the spring um, and just worked on it over the summer. I reached out to it and said, hey, we didn't do this. They said, yeah, you're not a Lone Ranger. Get it accomplished. And um, it was a project that I completed over the summer, shared with administrators when they came back in August. The second area of that uh, under that health services requirement that we were out of compliance for the second half of the year was early in the year, I want to say two, three months in, our nurse, uh, we had this nurse, she went back to working at the ER. There are certain things that a nurse, we have to have a nurse to do. The primary one um, is delegation of authority around, uh, the primary one we use them for is around uh, the authority to and training to administer insulin. So let's say we have, I think currently we have three diabetic students in our district. Last year, our, and our people that have been doing this, they've been doing it for a long time. Big Elementary's had diabetic kids since 2005 when I was principal there, was giving kids shots. Uh, but about 10 years or so ago, they said, okay, Mr. Carpenter, you can't just have somebody come out and give you training to give the shot and then go away. You have to go through this delegation process where an RN gives me training which our RN did, they trained all these people, they've been doing it for a long time. But then every three to six months, they're supposed to come back in and check in on you. It's gotta be the same person that delegated me. Am I still comfortable? Do I know what I'm doing? 
So the second half of that last year, uh, we didn't have those check-ins with our people that were doing this service. Uh, we still don't have nurses. So uh, in August, they started talking to Broca about this. We need, to, hey, we need to get this problem solved. We've now contracted with a provider. So it's very expensive, but um, they come out, train our people, do all the paperwork, and they sign off. They, they assign Gary now, delegated the authority to get insulin, and they'll come back with the pain each time to check in uh, with our people throughout uh, the school year. I don't want to, you know, we still have our nurses job open. I actually have a nurse that I'm having a meeting with later this week that is interested uh, in a part-time job, which is really what we need. You know, I don't need, if we have a full-time nurse and that's all we can get, we'd die her. But they'd be doing a lot of things that we don't really need a nurse for. Um, so I'm going to talk with this lady. In a perfect world, we can get her hired. Uh, if she's great and stays, great. But I'm also in conversations with ESD uh, with several other rural school districts that are in the same mind. It's just hard to find a nurse. And um, <laughs> In a perfect world, we could get five of them. ESD would hire them, and each district is paying for 0.2 of that person. So if we had a, whatever the cost, $125,000 nurse, um, you know, each of us is paying $25,000 or whatever for this person to do the best for the school year. So um, those are the two areas we're out of compliance. Again, I've written up kind of what we've done and how we've corrected. Uh, this will get put, this doesn't require board action. It just requires that I share uh, with the school board uh, this information. It'll be posted on the district website uh, on our uh, state reports page, along with previous years. And what else? Tomorrow, uh, the minutes from the meeting is a process I have to go through over the next week. The list will all get submitted to the state. Um, they'll accept my plan, or they'll say, "Well, we don't. You did something wrong here. We'll fix this." Well, I'll get some feedback of this, and they'll say, you're on track. I'll get to go. That's where we're at. Vision 22, I have till November 15th to get it updated. That's why we always need to do this, this report in October. Any questions on anything with Vision 22? I do. Um, on that first uh, piece that you weren't in compliance with about the different samples, uh, I was just wondering like, what would happen if a student were to miss out on one of those like, sample requirements because, for example, I took uh, my health course online uh, through West Lane, and so I was just wondering like, if I was to make up that like no, sample. It's not a graduation requirement or anything. It's just uh, the reason they were first implemented is uh, we're pre-COVID, essentially in, the, in high school, we had exit exams, right? Kid, JD was a junior, he would take his math exit exam and he failed by one point. Well, you've got the next year to pass that, your senior year. So what we did again 10 years ago is as a senior, one of the ways you can pass your state test without retaking it is a qualifying work sample. So the idea with kids doing work samples throughout their career is they're familiar with the process, they know how to do it. So that if they get to be a senior and they need to do a work sample to pass the requirement of the state test, um, that is a foreign concept to them that they can do that. So again, going back when that was a requirement for the seniors that were like JT, say we had 11 juniors that didn't pass the state test in math, they get assigned to a special math class, first period of the day, they brought 11 different of us. Maybe JT is really bad at geometry, so that's what you're working on, Gary's that algebraic equations, so that's what I'm working on. It's kind of individualized instruction, and once our skill level gets a little bit better, a little later in the fall, we do a work sample. And maybe out of those 11, five or six of us would pass, we would send them off to the state, they get scored, we'd pass, now we've met that graduation requirement. And as soon as the kids pass that, they could drop and get out of that class. So um, it's really just about um, uh, the way they were used in the past, make sure kids are familiar. They could be used as a way to pass the state test. It's not any kind of graduation requirement. It's just a best practice to make sure kids have this opportunity to show their skill. Good question. First question from the student rep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Moving on, and uh, I guess this is just confirming that yeah, we don't see see our agreed packet. Yeah, you got eight of them at uh, the next board meeting. Um, you'll so make sure you review. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, at the next board meeting, uh, we'll go through a process of nominating 
Uh, any of those eight are eligible, uh, and you will nominate and vote five of them to serve on the committee. So, if you don't have a copy of those, that be right. Uh, should be good to go. That would be an agenda item on the board every week. So, I know that I'll be asking, I don't have to ask now, but I know that I'll be asking, what is the process of this? I think the process will be, um, it's rare, first of all, it's rare that we have more than five. Oftentimes at this time of year, we only have, uh, we have nobody fly, so we're in Vegas, you know. Okay. But I think the best process for here will be, well, I think names will listen up in alphabetical order. Community member Gary Carpenter's first. Uh, anybody want to make a motion? Yep. Well, uh, Andrea, I, I nominate Gary Carpenter to be on the budget committee. Kathleen seconds, we vote. Only Kathleen and Andrea voted for Gary, so he's not on the committee. We're going to the next thing. Um, okay, next thing is Barbie. Hopefully, if we go through the whole list, hopefully we get five. If we don't get five, then we probably need to go back to the top and go down again. So if anybody has a different way, I, I'm open to anything, but I did talk to OSBA about the process with eight people, and um, that was what they shared is most common. Popsicles. <laughs> Next topic we have the transit water request form and that is the board action. Yes, this is um I said a lot of information on this. Lisa asked a good question the other day. Hopefully Andrew understands it now. Um this is what every district in Lane County does. Nobody currently in Lane County takes more than 50%. If we did tell them, we have the right to do that, tell the ESD, we're taking 100%. But then they're saying, okay, for if you don't get access to all our PD and all our people that help you with textbook adoption and curriculum planning, and um, you don't have any say in the local service plan. And frankly, a district like us pulling out, I think we, I want to say it's like 3.12%. So for every dollar the ESD gets from all the districts, they get about three cents from us. We're not going to have much impact. If 4J pulled out, it'd be a problem. Or Springfield pulled out. Uh, you know, 4J, I, I would imagine, is close to half of their revenue. And that has come up in the yeah, past. Yeah, depending yeah. on the superintendent and 4J, sometimes they say it hasn't ever happened, but they've threatened, you know, we're going to fly to ESD, which then would decimate the services that smaller districts get. Um, in the last 10 years, the superintendent there has, understands that this is just a, a service that helps balance equity around the state and around the community. Uh, around the county, uh, and I, I don't foresee um, that happening. So anyway, uh, we get, um, like I shared with you in the email, um, it's over 4%, just over 4% um, of every dollar we get, ESD gets, and then we can draw back half of that, which we mostly draw back to help with our special ed programs, our bigger classrooms, I uh, use it to pay those programs, and the other two cents per dollar stays with them, and they support us in a lot of different ways. Uh, this one does need board action um, to somebody needs to make a motion to agree to not exceed 50%. I'll make a motion to accept the trend dollar request. Second. For fiscal year 2025 26 to not exceed 50%. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Any questions? All in favor? Hi. 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 Um, we have second reading of proposed policy updates and uh, also the final board action. I move to accept these uh, policy board policy updates that have been presented for second reading. Mm -hmm. and the second. I'll second that. There's a motion and a second to accept our second reading of the post policy updates and all in favor? Aye. 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 Well, then we have the first reading that does not require any action at this time, so we'll just get in here in three goes. Yeah, if you have any questions in the next few weeks, we'll be approached the next board meeting. I know what this policy is coming up. Um, up next is our Oregon School Board Association, that's the roadshow. 
Yeah, Mark and I attended this. I'll let you go first, Mark. Do you have anything you want to share? Uh, you know, it it was actually I'm afraid of old numbers. I mean, I think there's been more in the past that we've gone to this. I think I've gone to every one of them in the last uh, seven years or eight years, and uh, which I was a little surprised. I don't know what was going on, but it was pretty nice out. I guess it wasn't raining. Um, uh, not a whole lot. I mean, they introduced new people. There's new legislative people that are representing OSBA. Um, there's a new um, person in charge of OSBA. There's they're having budget issues, so they're raising the prices. Uh, they haven't raised the price in 20 years, so the cost, huh? 25, 25 years, I think, for dues for schools. So that's being raised, and there's going to be a plan uh, where it raises basically like the. Um, Cost of living type raise and, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, we're going to be voting next month on some resolutions and some um, some things that have to do with OSBA board. And there's, uh, from, in my opinion, from the temperature of the room, there's still some contention going on at the, on the OSBA board. <laughs> um, so, and I mean, that wasn't just from necessarily one person. It seemed like there was potentially more than one that was like, giving that deal off, I guess. And so, um, there definitely was last year at the the meeting um, after the um, the convention. I know that was it was crazy, but um, so I guess you know that's about all I have really. Yeah, just to dovetail, dues increase. They're gonna. Like Mark said, they haven't raised it in 25 years. For us, it's around 2,500 bucks. But the reason is significant. They're going to raise it 15% a year for five years. But, and then after that, they're going to go to CPI. So we'll be almost double probably in five years um, from 2,500 to uh, again, ballpark members to say 5,000. Uh, at the same time, though, that it's tremendous value. I mean, just their attorney services, one, you know, Hour long call or significant problem that they're helping us with is super good value. So I'm not definitely not worried about the increase. But in their bylaws, the only way they can vote to increase their dues is if members, all of you guys, the 197 school districts in the state of Oregon, vote in favor. So if you only decide on uh, November that'll be an item to vote to approve their plan to increase their dues or not. This is something that could go down, which I think would just in turn. They would have to say, okay, we're, we got to have some services. Um, so, my recommendation I'm not worried about them doubling our $2,500 uh, a year bill to $5,000 over the next five years to provide some great service. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you know, a lot of their they have advocacy people there with the legislature who are the lobbyists for uh, their respective folks, we have the most VA people there. And you know, the governor's budget is. Um, what is this? This is an uh, even number year, 2024. In an even number year, this legislature is a short session. That's what they have in the spring. We're going into 2025, a lot of odd years, like a long session, normally from mid January to mid June. The, the, the governor, by statute, has to have their proposed budget out by December 1st. So I'll be looking for that in the November as we approach December 1st. She has said um, uh, lots of positive things around the number that they're coming out with, um, which the number I heard is 11.2, 11.2 billion for the next biennium for the next two years. Um, two negative things that they're really going to advocate for that possibly add on to that 11.2. So number one is unemployment insurance. So they've been doing a bunch of data gathering from districts, but in this last session, the legislature passed um, gave a lot more folks within school districts the ability to apply for unemployment insurance. So whether it's a bus driver that isn't driving the bus over winter break or spring break, or an IA that doesn't work in the summer or over winter break, um, uh, that they have the ability to, during those breaks, apply for unemployment insurance. If everyone that was eligible in our district applied for unemployment insurance, Every time that they were possible, the revenue numbers last year were quantum. We, typically, we budgeted around forty thousand dollars a year for for unemployment insurance. It would push a million dollars, and we're self-insured. Um, so one of the, they were collecting up. We didn't have that many people. We had more than usual. Um, one of the things 
that I've talked to our associations about doing, some districts kind of got in front of it and said, they're offering everybody in your their district to work in the summer. So I can put out an email in June and say, every staff member in front of it, if you want to work all summer, I'll work in your pulling weeds, painting, cleaning out lockers, whatever. Um, I didn't go that route. I wanted to see, you know, what I stressed with our members, uh, for example, when I met the class my being president, I basically said, I'm going to see how it goes and know that if our bill goes from 20000 to 200000 we're going to need to take a $180,000 cut amongst our classified pool of folks. And so I think they talked about that with the members, and as a result, they have to the cut funds. So that's something that they're going to be advocating for, is taking this, you know, um, they're trying to get state funding up to a, a quality education model level, but they're adding these unfunded mandates, like this new employment insurance. Well, that helps take us down. The second thing is PERS rates. Last, we get new PERS rates every two years. Last time, without knowing the exact numbers, our PERS rates went down like a tenth of a percent. There's two different kinds of PERS rates. There's PERS and there's OPSERV. In our district, 16% uh, of our employees are PERS employees. Meaning they were hired, I think it was 2001. Before 2001, they were in the PERS system. Um, the rest of our employees are OPSERV employees. Their benefits aren't quite as great as PERS employees, a little bit less. Um, they're still pretty good. They're still pretty good. Um, our PERS uh, rate, again, is currently 13.37. And again, two years ago, it might have been 13.6. It actually went down a little bit. Okay, that was great for us. Uh, new PERS rates are coming, and this is the standard around the state. Ours are actually less than some other places. They're going from 13.3 to 17.6. So you can think of it as well, it's a 4% raise. Well, it's really a 33% raise. It's a third more. Um, our OPSERP is going from 10.5 uh, to 14.42%. Uh, what does that equate to in dollars? For us, 400000 So right off the top. If let's say we're getting, let's say the new model comes out, we know we're getting funded 400,000 greater, that's all come on, uh, just from our first rates. Um, so it's something I'm gonna be working on with Juan over the next few months trying to create us. We have a first reserve to help with this. We stock money away for when first rates fluctuate. We're, we're gonna be able to deal with this um, fine in the short term. I mention it because you're going to hear a lot of advocacy around, okay, Governor, the base number is 11.2. Do you think that meets rollout costs is the term that they use? But in fact, we're not taking into account these extra costs of unemployment purge rates, so we think it should be 11.6. That's what they're going to focus their advocacy on is of what above that base number from these unfunded mandates um, can be the legislature to agree to. So, uh, you probably some more from me about that in the coming months, but uh, that was a big topic at the meeting. That's all I have. Excuse me. I have a couple of questions for OSVA. I heard you say that the last time that they did raise the rates, which was 25 years ago. Um, how long have they been in business? No idea. No, okay. And how long have we been with OSVA? Um, yeah, I'll find out from both those answers. Certainly, I would imagine we've been involved with them since their inception, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Certainly for my life, you know, a long time in here. So are there other companies out there that does the same thing, or do they have one monopoly on this? Um, there's nobody out there that does what OSBA does for us, no. I mean, they insure us through their pace. So all schools in Oregon are insured through pace, which is an arm of OSBA. Um, they write all of our policy um, to meet Oregon law and statute. I know of no one else that does what they do. Oh, OSBA was founded in 1946. There you go, 1946. And they're not, they're more an organization than a company. Yeah, they're not an organization. They're, I don't think that they are set up to make money. They're set up right. to no. be able to afford to provide services to their member to school boards. I, not I would assume, I don't know specifically, that I'm probably 99% sure they're not within this area. I'll find out when we joined. Uh, that'd be good to know. 
Some upcoming events, and you guys can see what listed there. Important community involvement. If anybody wanted to share things that they have done? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so soccer games, volleyball games, football games, commodities, and that work. Lots. There you It was an invitation. I don't know if they want to do Thanks, <laughs> Lisa. You're welcome. All right. So at this point, we will, um, the school board will now remain in an executive session for the purpose of hearing a complaint brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent. The executive ex session is held pursuant to ORS 192.660. 1B, which allows the board to meet in a executive session for this specific activity. No decision may be made in executive session except for student expulsion. At the end of the executive session, we will return to open session and we are going to ask our members of the audience to leave the room at this time. So at this point, we have exited our executive session and we do have to take action on the complaints, appeal to the board. Um, is there anyone who wishes to make a motion? Yeah, I'd like to move that we need to go on vacation. Any second? Okay, we're not here in a second. So I would say that motion failed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do we have any motion on that point? I think a motion that we, um, we do not, uh, Ask for any more information that we do not um, do anything beyond the superintendent's decision. Do we have a second on that? I'll second it. And do we have a vote? Oh, do I call all in favor? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Aye. Okay, we have three, two, two. Motion carries. And at this point, we will go